Don Hertzfeld's World of Tomorrow is a masterpiece. I usually try to avoid throwing that word around, but there simply isn't any other way to describe it. Instead of beating us over the head with how important and vital a work of art it is, Hertzfeld balances content and humor in a way where both elements are able to elevate each other through their sheer subjectivity. While this is hardly an original idea, I think that World of Tomorrow is a shining example of this balance being done right, because Hertzfeld allows the viewers to decide if they're gonna apply any meaning to the short and view it as an intellectual piece, or simply enjoy it as if it were comedy like his earlier work. It's, it's great for me to hear, you know, those different reactions, because when I travel with, with a movie like this, it's very similar, you know, you hear a line in one city get a big laugh, and then in another city the same line kind of gets a gasp. With World of Tomorrow, Don Hertzfeld is championing subjectivity in a way that I think is vital in a time where an audience's insecurity over how we look at art and media is at a fever pitch. And if that wasn't enough, the film accomplishes this in less than 20 minutes through its setting and characters. Yes, it is very pretty. The setting of World of Tomorrow is what I like to call a tactical dystopia, a society that isn't inherently or obviously bad. The World of Tomorrow may not be as undeniably unpleasant as Oceana in 1984 was, but it still shares some of its characteristics, like a subservient society and the omnipresence of technology. It's also similar to Fahrenheit 451 in Brave New World, where most people have been drugged into submission and don't even realize that they're miserable. The only difference is that in World of Tomorrow, society's drug of choice is memory, as opposed to something like Soma. For example, the citizens of Tomorrow enjoy watching the harvested memories of other people. There's also Emily's clone, who takes her younger self on a literal trip down memory lane, even though she knows and understands how dangerous it is to live in the past. We mustn't linger. It is easy to get lost in memories. Being a tactical dystopia aids the subjectivity of the piece because it keeps these dystopian elements from becoming the central focus of the film. It's simply the backdrop in a tale that's more interested in being introspective. Hertzfeld's minimalist art style is the perfect complement for this. It's sparse and lacks dimension, as though it's trying not to distract us. After all, it's a tactical dystopia. The dystopian elements are designed to be somewhat hidden from us, but also noticeable enough that they might spur some conversation and debate. I no longer fall in love with rocks. It still has influence over the stories and the characters, but in a much less obvious way than in traditional dystopia. Instead, our characters propel the story. And our main character, Emily Prime, serves the important purpose of keeping World of Tomorrow from collapsing under the sheer weight of its concepts. <laughs> Her ability to fulfill this purpose comes from the ground up, by being designed to be so not from the same place as everything else in the film. Her dialogue was curated from hours of Hertzfeld recording his niece drawing and playing at home before being used to build the story. It was sort of like a, a fun puzzle to kind of figure out what she could be looking at when, when they're doing these things. And then once I sorted that out, I brought in Julia Pott, who voiced the adult Emily and rewrote her lines so that they could have a conversation. And while the script was written around her audio, she never quite lines up with the rest of the world. She keeps the film subjective by being almost completely out of Hertzfeld's control. Winona May's Emily Prime is kinda like cinema verite, filmmaking that's characterized by its realism and avoidance of script, guidance, and artistic effect. While her clone is fixated on questions of life and meaning while also having access to advanced technology, Emily Prime is just a four-year-old. Basically, she keeps her clone from making too concrete of a point and running the risk of becoming inaccessible for some viewers. I have no idea what you're talking about. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Okay. And Emily Prime does this through the use of comedy. By constantly pulling Emily's clone away from her thoughts, Emily Prime is leaving it up to the audience whether or not they want to apply meaning to whatever she was discussing, or if they'd rather just laugh at the interruption. I dropped a triangle. I drew a snake boy. She's expressing a form of cinema verite from within the film itself, pulling it away from answers and cinematic qualities such as scripted dialogue and back towards subjectivity and reality. She's the reason why we can decide how we want to enjoy the film. Going back to Hertzfeld's art style, the way he draws characters makes them appear more playful than complex. And I think this complements the argument I'm trying to make because with the art style, it isn't necessarily about our ability to read how they feel, but rather how we as an audience perceive their emotions. 
It's like the Kuleshov effect, when an audience applies meaning to a series of images that may or may not already have meaning applied to them. We're allowed and somewhat encouraged to feel however we'd like about the characters. What is he now? The dirty old man. I think that's the point of World of Tomorrow. Not that Alfred Hitchcock's a dirty old man, but to bask in the subjectivity of existence. On a larger level, it questions what the quality of human life may devolve into if we're left with de facto immortality. And the film postulates that we're probably going to be in for a rough ride. Oh, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh my God, Holy Mother of God, oh, 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 oh God. If it isn't getting tortured from within a Nintendo GameCube, it's going to be getting repeatedly photocopied until we lose our ability to understand our own emotions. I do not have the mental or emotional capacity to deal with his loss. And if we make it past that, we're still all going to die when a meteor hits us or when we warp into the atmosphere trying to escape said meteor. Uh, okay? No, they're all dead. So why should we let that bother us? We should embrace our individuality by allowing ourselves to approach art and media however we'd like to. Especially because artists like Hertzfeld are extremely open-minded towards how people receive his work. In a 2015 interview with CutPrintFilm.com, Hertzfeld was asked how he hoped viewers would feel or what they'd think about after watching the film. And he replied, I guess it's a happy film, or one of my happier films. But then I hear a lot of people say it's rather sad. And I guess that's valid too. I think there's many ways to look at it, and hopefully that's what makes it interesting to watch. The only good answer I can ever come up with is anything but boredom. If you hate it, at least hate it passionately. By balancing philosophy and comedy, Hertzfeld created a work that's accessible enough for people in need of laughs, and also caters to an audience in need of a bit more substance. Viewers are always going to take different things from World of Tomorrow, as well as any other movie that gets made. The only way that would ever change is if our species lost its individuality in the same way that the World of Tomorrow did. So while some of us may enjoy specific qualities in World of Tomorrow more than others, does it really matter? Especially if we all still enjoyed the film. And even if we don't, who cares?